Communist State of Illinois. Voting Does Not Work. An Analysis. Originally published on July 21st, 2015 at libertyunderattack.com and read to you by the author. Since I found true libertarianism, I have become morally objected to any method or strategy of working within the system. In addition to that, I canceled my voter registration this past April, so I couldn't vote even if I wanted to. As I've explained in previous articles, voting is a violation of both the non-aggression principle and the axiom of self-ownership. Voting is just one of many reformist activities. It has proven to be ineffective and the ever-growing number of uninformed, unintelligent voters should be enough to deter the more philosophically sound reformists from participating. But unfortunately, those same folks attempt to use the political process to violently force their ideals and beliefs, no matter how well-intentioned, onto the rest of the citizenry. In every state, voter fraud is also an issue, whether it be a minor or major one. Adding in the fact that individual voter strengths are far below one vote, voter fraud only makes your one vote that much more minuscule and, much, and that much less democratic. There's also one other point that needs to be discussed before we move forward, and that would be the Downs Median Voter Theorem. Kyle Reardon from the Alaska Steel blog has already covered this topic and has put it in a more succinct manner than I could, so I'll provide you with his explanation. Quote, Downs Median Voter Theorem narrows the range of options down to a set of strict binary choices that are in fact so very similar to each other as to be nearly indistinguishable in substance, even though they may seem superficially dissimilar. Any other choices that may be presented from time to time are not given equal weight as the two primary darlings are. The left-right paradigm manipulates the median voter theorem so as to artificially limit the serious political candidates to those who are beholden to the dual hegemonic political parties." End quote. The Downs median voter theorem surely assists, assists in seeing through the fog of this dualistic, false, dichotic political system America is encompassed by. It also explains why third parties are hard-pressed to even have a chance of becoming the next political rulers. Now that I've laid out some of the major issues when it comes to voting, I'd like to focus strictly on the communist state of Illinois. Some people believe that I call Illinois that as a joke, and to some extent that is true, although I would rather describe it as a form of Simon gesturing. Nonetheless, I don't say it lightly. The communist state of Illinois is a multifaceted monster, and I do intend on tackling all of the various facets, but for this endeavor, I will focus on voting in Illinois. Part 1. Is this so-called democracy really democratic? First off, I think it's important to examine what democracy is objectively. Democracy at its most basic form is simply tyranny of the majority. If 51% of a nation's citizenry decide, decide that you should be hung in the streets, you can expect to be hung in the streets because the people have spoken. Additionally, democracy is simply a political buzzword with another connotation, one with much deadlier ramifications. Karl Marx, co-author of the Communist Manifesto and a revolutionary socialist, stated that, quote, democracy is the road to socialism, end quote. Vladimir Lenin, head of the USSR and communist revolutionary, shared similar sentiments, quote, democracy is indispensable to socialism, end quote. One citizen, one vote. Not even close. One of the major misconceptions when it comes to voting is that it is the majority making these coercive, political, politically binding decisions, regardless of which of the various states we are talking about. Not only is that not the case, a voter's one vote isn't even relatively close to one vote. It would first be wise to mathematically determine what the, power, the voter power is of each Illinoisan. Using the Bands Half Power Index, we can calculate each individual's voting power in the United States using a document linked in the article as a guide, which shows the data sets necessary to perform the calculations. First thing you need to, deter need to determine is the population of the state, in this example, Illinois. The population of Illinois is around 13 million people. Next, using the table provided in uh, the original article, you'll need to determine the electoral, co electoral college votes, which for Illinois is 21. Next, divide the electoral college votes by the total population of the state. In this case, 21 divided by 13 million. An Illinoisan's voter's share of the state's electoral votes would be 0 .0000016538. The next step would be to quantitatively analyze the voting power of an individual in Illinois. No matter what state, one will be in the numerator and the respective state population in the denominator. In this case, the square root of 13 million 
will be multiplied by the bands of power index, 0.387. For Illinois, the equation you get is 1 divided by the square root of 13 million times 0.387. The bands of power index of each voter in Illinois is roughly .0011. I will hedge my bets on the fact that democracy isn't so democratic, at least here in Illinois. Voter turnout percentages. The next data set to analyze is the actual voter turnout percentages. For this example, I have chosen McLean County and the city of Bloomington. For both of these variables, I gather the amount of registered voters, ballots cast, the unofficial voter turnout, population in the various years, and then the actual voter turnout when factoring in the entire population instead of just registered voters. Uh, the full Excel uh, spreadsheet is linked in the original article. What I found was not surprising, but surely unsettling. For the city of Bloomington, the data set contains every election from 1996 to, to 2015. When I average out the voter turnout percentage provided by the website that hosts their statistics, it came out to be 31.43%. The only problem with that statistic is that they are only factoring in the registered voters and the ballots cast, not the entire population of Bloomington. 31.43% of the registered voters making coercive politically binding decisions for the rest of the citizenry is bad enough, but don't worry, it gets worse. When I took into account the entire population, the average dropped significantly down to 17.82%. Same process was used for McLean County, except they only, they only make this, these statistics for 2007 to 2015 available. Using the voter turnout percentages provided by McLean County, the average voter turnout was a mere 29.33%. Again, those numbers are deceptive as they only factor in registered voters and ballots cast, not the entire population of McLean County. The official voter turnout, when taking into account the entire population of McLean County, came out to be 7.11%. Let's summarize what has been covered so far. First off, an Illinoisan's voter power index is about .0011, far under one vote, and far away from anything democratic. Next, in the city of Bloomington, on average, 17.82% of the population make these coercive, politically binding decisions upon the rest of the citizenry. In McLean County, it's much worse, as it is on average, only 7.11%. should be easy to realize, just from what has been covered so far, that voting in Illinois is a complete waste of time, and any semblance of democracy is an illusion. Although, there are a couple, a couple of other factors that need to be taken into account to further reiterate that point. Election fraud run amok in Chicago. If you ask any Illinoisan what they think about Chicago, you'll typically get the same response. Most acknowledge, especially if they are south of Interstate 80, that Chicago is the cesspool of politics and the amount of political corruption and voter fraud is a major concern for those who still believe in the legitimacy of the state. It's first important to explain the structure of the electoral system in Illinois. After the newly adopted Constitution in 1970, responsibility was transferred from the Secretary of State to a newly created Board of Elections. The Illinois election process is highly decentralized, and the previously mentioned State Board of Elections has limited authority over the many jurisdictions, which leads to inconsistencies and illegalities. Most jurisdictions are ran at the county level by a county clerk, but in Chicago it is operated under, operated under city election law, which allows cities to choose to govern their own elections independent, independently of their own county. Those details were mentioned to emphasize the fact that every county or city operates their elections in their own manner and separate from any central election authority, which has been prone to an increased level of voter fraud and overall political corruption. In a Moritz Law School, Ohio State University, 2007 publication titled From Registration to Recounts, they mentioned that, quote, According to news reports, in the last 25 years, some 50 separate election fraud prosecutions have occurred, many of them involving multiple offenders, end quote. One of the more egregious examples is after the 1982 gubernatorial elections. There were widespread allegations of fraud in Chicago, and there were nearly 60 convictions, and a civil grand jury concluded that 100,000 illegal ballots had been cast. Additionally, after the 1987 primary, it was discovered that between 36,000 and 52,000 votes had been cast by unregistered voters. Years later, in 2003, there was an attempt to cast 250 illegal votes in a city just outside of Chicago. There was another example of both voter fraud and political corruption when in November of 2004 in East St. Louis, a number of political political leaders were convicted of vote buying. 
The major concern in most states is tampering of the digital voting machines, but in Illinois, the major, major issue is absentee ballot fraud. In, pre in the previously mentioned Mort's Law publication, they state that, quote, Absentee fraud is a different issue entirely, as Illinois administrators also acknowledge. It is not a matter of whether such fraud occurs, but how often and in what magnitude, end quote. Even though absentee voter fraud is more prevalent, in the 2014 election, there were multiple voting machines that were switching votes from Republican to Democrat, which surely isn't an isolated problem only known to Illinois. It's quite simple to tell that voter fraud in the state of Illinois is a major issue, even though the uh, major issue. Even though the election laws have become more stringent and there are more precautions, it's naive to think that the political corruption is coming to a halt anytime soon in the cesspool of politics, otherwise known as Chicago. Additionally, the Illinois uh, Voter Power Index continues to become margin marginally lower thanks to the phenomenon of voter fraud. South of I-80, your vote really doesn't matter. From what has already been covered, any Illinoisan should at least stop voting altogether, or better yet, cancel their voter registration. Especially if you live in a jurisdiction south of Interstate 80, you should cut up your voter registration in sheer anger and frustration. That is, if you still believe in the most dangerous superstition, the belief in authority. Cook, DuPage, and Will counties are a few of the most populated counties, and therefore carry the most weight when it comes to state elections. The most significant being Cook County, though home to 40.6% of Illinois residents. Cook County alone racks up 65-70% to 70 of votes for the Democrats. Additionally, in the 2010 gubernatorial election, Pat Quinn could have been elected even if he'd only won Cook County. In a 2011 Wall Street Journal article, Alicia Finley accurately states that, quote, Chicago polls control all, almost all seats of power in Illinois. Governor Pat Quinn, House Speaker Mike Madigan, Senate President John Cullerton, Attorney General Lisa Madigan, and Secretary of State Jesse White are all Democrats from Chicago. So was former Governor Rod Blagojevich, I call Rod Blogayevich, <laughs> who, uh, who this month was sentenced to 14 years in prison for corruption, including trying to sell President Obama's vacated seat for the U.S. Senate. End quote. Illinoisans can thank the Democratic-controlled Chicago for that disparity. It's also important to mention that the majority of extortion, I mean tax dollars in Illinois, are spent in Chicago. Additionally, in a 2013 Illinois census, the population was virtually unchanged as a lot of businesses and citizens are fleeing to other states where the tax burden is much lower. In, a, in the previously mentioned 2011 Wall Street Journal, Journal article, Finley continues, quote, In 2008, lawmakers in Springfield cobbled together a $530, $530 million rescue package for Chicago's transit system, which was on the brink of collapse because of sky-high labor and legacy costs. Just, with, just this week, they pushed through $300 million of tax credits for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Chicago Board Options Exchange, and Sears to prevent the businesses from fleeing to lower tax climbs. Both Indiana and Ohio have been aggressively poaching Illinois businesses, especially since January when lawmakers raised the state income tax to, fl to a flat 5% from 3% and the corporate tax to 9.5% from 7.3%. End quote. It's no surprise that businesses are fleeing the communist state of Illinois, and it's even less surprising to see corporate bribery, using stolen tax dollars, being the method utilized to keep the big businesses in Illinois. The frustration felt by, citizen, by the citizens south of I-80 has been reflected in the Illinois House of, Representatives, House of Representatives as well. In 2011, Representatives Adam Brown and Bill Mitchell proposed legislation to make Chicago the 51st state. Of course, it was a massive failure, but an accurate representation of the I-80 divide. To conclude, an Illinois, Illinois' vote was already worthless, and if you're south of I-80, a voter registration card could be better used as kindling to start a fire of resentment for all things authoritarian. Let's imagine for a moment that your vote really does matter. Let's imagine that we are venturing through a magical forest, dancing with the unicorns under a rainbow, and at the end of the rainbow is Putin the leprechaun who is handing out rubles to all of the naive little voters. Let's imagine for a moment that an Illinoisan's vote really does matter. It has been emphasized heavily that Illinois has a long history of electoral corruption and voter fraud. But let's examine another angle. Most Illinoisans are well aware of the criminally tainted past involved with Chicago politics, the most recent criminal politician being Aaron Schock, a former member of the House of Representatives. Outside of going through every gruesome political detail, let's simplify this experiment and take a look at the effectiveness of voting in the communist state of Illinois. Now, this list was compiled by Thrillist. William Carruthers, 1976 to 1983, a former Chicago alderman, was charged with conspiracy and extortion and was sentenced to three years in prison. 
Isaac Carruthers, 1999 to 2010, also a former Chicago alderman and son of William, followed in his father's footsteps and got charged with the same exact extortion charge. He was sentenced to 28 months in prison. Daniel Rostenkowski, 1959 to 1995, a former member of the, House of the U.S. House of Representatives from Illinois, was convicted of dishing out postage stamps and adding imaginary employees to his taxpayer-funded payroll and bought himself gifts. He was sentenced to 17 months in prison. Dan Walker, 1973 to 1977, a former Illinois governor. After leaving office, Walker entered into the private sector and was convicted of fraud and was sentenced to seven years but only served 17 and a half months. Otto Kerner, 1963 to 1968, a former Illinois governor was a fan of under-the-table deals and obtained $356,000 worth of below-market stock from a horse racetrack operator. He then rigged choice racing dates and expressway exits that funneled crowds to the track. He was sentenced to three years. Fred Rohde, 1951 to 1956 as the Illinois State Senator, um, 1970 to 1993 as Chicago Alderman, was convicted of 11 counts of bribery, extortion, racketeering, and racketeering conspiracy. Rohde also served as a member of the La Cosa Nostra Mafia while he was in, a, in political office. He was sentenced to four years but only served three. George Ryan, 1991 to 1999, a former Illinois Secretary of State, uh, 1999 to 2003, a, a former Illinois Governor. This one is too good, so I will, uh, I will quote an article done by Thrillist in regards to Mr. Ryan. Quote, a fatal truck accident in 1994 got the ball rolling on an investigation cracking down on illegally acquired truck operators' licenses in Illinois. More than a decade later, Operation Safe Road had followed a trail of money and favors that led all the way to Governor George Ryan's doorstep. 79, 79 others were criminally charged, and Ryan was found guilty of, whopping, of a whopping 18 felony counts, including racketeering conspiracy, tax fraud, lying to the FBI, and mail fraud, end quote. He was sentenced to six and a half years. Rod Blagojevich, otherwise known as Rod Blagojevich, 2002 to 2009, a former Illinois governor, was charged with conspiracy, the shadiest of, shadiest of his dealings being when he attempted to sell President Obama's former Senate seat. He is currently serving a 14-year sentence. Orville Hodge, 1953 to 1956, a former Illinois auditor of public accounts, embezzled $6.15 million worth of state funds. He was sentenced to 12 to 15 years, but only served six and a half. Mel Reynolds, 1993 to 1995, a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Illinois, was indicted for sexual assault and criminal sexual abuse after he engaged in a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old girl. He was also convicted of 16 counts of bank fraud, lying to investigators from the Federal Electoral Commission, and misusing campaign funds. He got five years for the first sentence, six and a half years for the second, and President Clinton commuted his second sentence after four years. The list is incomplete, but nonetheless, many of these charges are quite egregious, and it paints a pretty clear picture. It doesn't matter if voting in Illinois matters or not. Illinoisans are still stuck with the same corrupt criminal scumbags. Conclusion as a resident of Illinois, I've been bound to Illinois in politics, whether I want to be or not. There is always a new politician facing prison time for some immoral, unethical offense. There are constant attempts to strip Illinoisans of their natural rights of self-defense, and the extortion fees, taxes, are relatively high compared to neighboring states. This article is going to be, uh, was going to be a more general overview of why I call this ge geographic location the communist state of Illinois, but with the vast number of topics to cover, I decided to stick to voting and make this into a series. To conclude, the voter power index of each Illinoisan is a mere .0011. In both of the variables selected, the average actual voter turnout percentage never went above 17.82%. The ever rampant voter fraud in Illinois decreases the impact of voters in Illinois even more, and could even cause a misrepresentation of the ballots cast in both of the examples I analyzed. Lastly, the long history of political corruption just puts the icing on the cake. No matter how you look at it, in the communist state of Illinois, you always lose. The goal of this article was to, conv to convince Illinoisans that voting here absolutely does not matter. I don't plan on converting anyone to the philosophy of liberty, but at the very least, I hope to save my fellow citizens the time, effort, and money that is wasted when it comes to Illinois politics. There are a couple of recommendations that will be reiterated. First off, if you still believe in the state, you could trade the opportunity cost of voting and spend your time doing something meaningful and more efficient, such as reporting on your political field trips, as I've done. Secondly, and what I would recommend the more strongly, is to cancel your voter registration altogether. There's a crucial point that Kyle Rudin made in his article titled, Voting Does Not Work. 
Granted, it was about voting in general and not necessarily specific to Illinois, but it still applies. Quote, The greatest tyranny is a tyranny of malicious illusion. Endorsing organized coercion by pretending it is somehow voluntary is not just unconscionable, but downright cruel. Dece deceitfully passing off vice as virtue is the last thing that truly consistent political dissidents would want to risk doing, lest they be discovered to be just as hypocritical as those they intend to defeat. End quote. Voting in and of itself is forcing your beliefs upon others the complete opposite of freedom. It's not even democratic, which has been proven, at least in the state of Illinois. So many citizens and politicians will tout America as this great democracy, when in reality it's nothing more than a malicious illusion. The entire system of oppression grinds us down under its jackbooted heel, and it does so primarily through its very irrationality. I hope I have demonstrated here that with not much else other than logic and math, the reformism permeate, permeating contemporary American dissent is truly authoritarianism clothed in liberty's garments. My frequent, ref frequent, ref frequent references to the communist state of Illinois is to impart upon you all that tyranny is nothing to be played around with, as if it were a young, ch young child's toy. If you are serious about restoring liberty, then some, o then some overdue maturing needs to take place about the nature of your relationship to the state. You've just heard the communist state of Illinois, Voting Does Not Work, an analysis. Originally published on July 21st, 2015 at libertyunderattack.com and read to you by the author.